Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Phil, for your welcome this morning. It's nice to be back in one's own church after many weeks. For the last five or so weeks, I've worshipped in a different church every Sabbath. Some of those churches I'd worshipped in before, some I hadn't. But I'd like to just relate to you, um, and before I do that, I'd just like to thank Yelena, where is she, and all the team of people who did such a wonderful job in the, uh, preparing the atmosphere for uh, the service today. When we were in uh, Fort Lauderdale, down in Florida, we decided we'd go on the internet and find out where there were some churches. Well, there's a plethora of churches in Fort Lauderdale, so we just selected those which were near where we were staying. So um, we excluded all those which spoke a foreign language, and that narrowed it down to just a few, so we decided we'd set the GPS for the one that was nearest to where we were staying. Sorry? <laughs> so off we went. <clears throat> uh, don't always rely on GPSs because the church wasn't there. But anyway, we thought we'll go for the next one, so as we're driving, guess what? We passed the one that we were supposed to be going to. So we went there and walked in and we were the only white faces in a sea of black. But we were made very welcome. We couldn't stay till the end of the service because we had another appointment. So we had to leave as the preacher was finishing and that was at 12.40. The next week we decided that perhaps we will try another church and so we took the next nearest one which was in the opposite direction and we went there and guess what? We were once again the only white faces in a sea of black. Not that that was a problem. And this church, the first church I suppose would have been about a little bit bigger than this church. Uh, the second one was over 400 members. And there we, um, we were able to stay to the finish of the service. And so um, at 1.30, you heard me correctly, at the finish of the service at 1.30, we were invited to stay for lunch. And we got away from that church about 3 o'clock. But why am, I, why am I telling you this? Because you know, it's a great object lesson. Wherever you go in this world and go to an Adventist church, you immediately feel part of the family. And the friendliness of both those churches was absolutely outstanding. Now I have to be frank, I haven't always experienced that. There's been a couple of times where I've come in and gone out and no one said boo to me. But, you know, that's understandable. But the fervour and the commitment of these folk was really quite outstanding. I haven't quite decided this morning which of those church services I'll emulate, whether I'll finish at 12.45 or 1.30, but we'll wait and see. <laughs> but it's great to belong to the family of God. And I hope that any visitors here this morning will feel as welcome here as my wife and my friends were, were made in Fort Lauderdale. And it's an object lesson to me of how we need to keep an eye open for visitors and make them feel welcome. Then when we came back from um, our trip overseas, I went to Sydney for some meetings and for a conference. And at the conference, we had organised for one of the guest speakers to come over here after the conference and be your preacher this morning. But unfortunately that speaker cancelled and didn't come to Sydney and the other speakers there were unable to change their schedule and come this morning. So um, I'm sorry, that's why you've got me this morning. So just pretend I'm an international expert, will you? While I was in Sydney, I was able to catch up with a few people, not that I intended to, but staying where I was staying, 
were the Austerings. And they moved into their house only on Thursday, so all the time they'd been staying at the Mission Hostel over there in Runga. And they invited me home uh, to their place for a meal before uh, I came over here. And I also met there the Laredos, and both the Austerings and the Laredos have asked that I convey their greetings to every church member here. Where I met the Laredos, by the way, was on Wednesday night, I think it was, when I went and saw Hell and Mr Fudge. So I've had a preview. So I recommend it to you, so make sure you're here on Friday night at 7 o'clock. Just let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as we come to study your word today, we just pray that your presence will be here to guide and direct us. May we each one be uplifted and helped. This morning I pray in Jesus' name. Very early in my career, I was sent up to Singapore to a workshop. What the workshop was doesn't matter. But during the, um, we had the breakfast in the hotel and at lunchtime <coughs> the workshop provided a meal for us. In the evening we had to fend for ourselves. So a group of us would go from a hotel, <coughs> and from memory I think it was Booker Tima Road, walk down to some food halls down on Scotts Road. And I noticed that as we walked along each night, a rather unpleasant odour assailed our nostrils. And about the third night I couldn't contain myself any longer and I exclaimed about this. Now I've always been a great admirer of Singapore. If you want to go to a clean city, a well-ordered city, go to Singapore. And so it just didn't fit to me that this terrible odour seemed to be emanating, I thought perhaps from the water course. I even thought that perhaps effluent had escaped. And so I, not able to contain myself, I made a comment. And one of the locals said, oh no, 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 no. You know what the problem is? Over there. And I looked over there, and this is what I saw. <laughs> and I said, well, I, I, it's a fruit stall. I don't expect to get a perfume from that. I know that many of you now know what I'm talking about. I've heard it, heard it already said. But I'd never experienced this before. And I said to the person, well, you know, I, I know many fruits. And even in their worst state of decay, they don't smell like that. <laughs> but he assured me that's what it was. And I know, and I've noticed many people here know now that durian, in fact, is pretty foul smelling. In fact, they call it the fruit with halitosis. So it's universally accepted that durian has a very foul smell. <laughs> so many people concur with me about the odour that comes from durian. <clears throat> they enticed me eventually to try one and I didn't get too far with that and I decided there was something I didn't really want to educate my palate to and get a liking to. But its smell is so bad, and those who've been to Asia will have seen this, there are signs all over the place banning durian. Durian is not allowed to be brought into the hotel. No durians. Notice this, one extra day's rental will be chargeable to a renter <laughs> in this vehicle pervades with pungent smell of durians. <clears throat> but you know, when I tried it, this probably uh, is about what I was doing. So many other people have tried it and many people like me aren't impressed. But you know, some people love this stuff. Did you know that? Look at this. They seem to be enjoying it. And in fact, you know, and this sign will show you, no durians please, but notice what it says underneath. Durian is locally known as the king of fruit. For the life of me, I can't understand that. But they tell me once you've acquired a taste, it is the king of fruit. But I'm going to take their word for it. <laughs> the simple fact is, it seems that if you persevere with something long enough, you'll get hooked on it. Is that correct? Well, 
I certainly can attest for that in some of my own experience. <clears throat> when I was young, excuse me, my father was often sent away to work and if he was going to be away for an extended period of time, mum and myself would join him and we'd spend up to 12 months away, sometimes in Australia, sometimes overseas like Tasmania. <laughs> oh, and New Zealand, I'm sorry, yes. But when we moved to um, and spent 12 months in Adelaide, and I don't know what age I was, I know I wasn't going to school. So um, I was probably around about four or something like that. But, sorry? Was it three? Thank you, Shirley. Because <laughs> Shirley was in Adelaide then, by the way. <laughs> I probably was three and a half, actually. <laughs> but anyway, my parents loved olives. Now, for the life of me, I couldn't understand that. And you need to remember that in, the, in, in those days, in the dark ages, when Shirley and I were around, you know that things weren't as readily available as we see in the shops today. And where we came from on the eastern coast of, uh, of Australia, you weren't able to buy olives very readily. And if you did, they were expensive. You know, we didn't get them all nicely packaged like this in the shops. And if they were in a container, they were very expensive. So we, we rarely had olives. But when they got to Adelaide, wow, there's plenty of olives. And so Dad bought a kerosene tin full of the stuff. Now, probably some of the younger people don't know what a kerosene tin's like, so I better show you. I couldn't get a pristine picture, but this is what an old, rusty kerosene tin looks like. Now, what's a kerosene tin used for? Well, they put kerosene in, obviously, isn't it? But you know, in those days, they found many other uses. Remember, we weren't as affluent in those days, so you made the best use of everything you could. You actually recycled, did you know that? Yeah. So they were used to carry water, watering cans, put flour in, and olives. Anyway, Dad brought home this kerosene tin of olives and deposited them right there in the kitchen. And I'd watch them eating those things, and every now and then I'd walk past and I'd take one, take a bite, and ooh, I'd rush to the rubbish bin. I mean, so for those who are Mac users, the trash bin, and spit it out. But you know, curiosity really got to me, so every now and then I'd pick one up and bite it, and then run away and spit it out. And one day, I bit the thing, I thought, well, you know, perhaps it isn't all that bad after all. So I chewed it, I actually ate it, and the only thing I spat out was the seed. So I can attest that you can acquire a taste, you can educate your palate. And by the way, that's what these things look like. <laughs> you can actually educate your palate. And do you know what? It's well been shown, and I can now understand how people do become to like durian, just like I became to like olives, and I love them now. But the simple fact is, the things we choose to eat become the things we love to eat. Now today, just moving on a little bit, what we are seeing is almost an epidemic of disease. We saw a little bit of that on our In Focus this morning. And these are what we call the diseases. Well, let me put this up first of all. What are the modern day killers? And there's been a dramatic change in what is killing our population today. What are the major causes of death today? Let's back, go back and look first of all in 1900. The major cause of death was due to communicable diseases. They just call them CDs. Do you know, back in the 1900, 35% of deaths were due to pneumonia, tuberculosis and diarrhoea. But only, and notice this, only about 13% was due to heart and cancer. In 2005, the major cause of death was due to non-communicable diseases. These are non-infectious diseases. 
only 2.5% of non-communicable diseases were due to influenza and pneumonia in 2005. So we've seen a switch from communicable or infectious diseases to non-communicable diseases or non-infectious diseases. But what has happened now is that we have a massive increase in heart disease and cancer, 50%. And in this time, the death from heart disease has doubled and the death from cancer has trebled. So what's the cause of this? What is causing these non-communicable diseases? We also call them the disease of affluence. What is the cause of this? Well, what are these diseases of affluence, I should say? First of all, heart disease, cancer stroke, diabetes, osteoporosis, arthritis, Alzheimer's and dementia, yes it does kill. And I need to put up here metabolic disease. How many people have heard of metabolic disease? A few have. This is a term which is used to refer to where three out of five of particular conditions occur together. Such things as abdominal fat, uh, elevated blood pressure, fasting glucose, elevated triglycerides and low HDL. And these are the major disease of affluence, the major non-communicable diseases. So what are the causes of these non-communicable diseases? First of all, smoking, alcohol, lifestyle, lack of exercise, diet and obesity. Did you know that the world today is suffering an epidemic of obesity? And they now have a term for it. It's called globesity. In 1950, 700 million people were malnourished and 100 million were obese. Not all in America, but that's where you tend to associate it with, isn't it? But look what's happened now in 2010. There are 800 million malnourished people, but 5 million obese people. And the projection is that by 2030, there'll be 1 billion obese people in the world if the current projections continue. Now, why is this? Why are we seeing this epidemic of globesity? And it's interesting that Dr. Barry Popkin at the University of North Carolina who's been studying this epidemic has made this comment. No country has transitioned from hunger without shifting to obesity. So why is this? Are we eating just too much, too much good food? And so we now have a global problem. It's called globesity. The simple fact is the world's population is getting fatter. So what are the causes or the reasons for this epidemic? First of all, lifestyle. I think I probably don't need to expand on that. Just one minute. I picked up a whole lot of papers that fell out from underneath the rostrum, <laughs> which I don't think I want. Unless you want me to go to 1.30, that is. <clears throat> and the second one is diet. Now, what's the problem with diet? It's the modern Western diet. What's wrong with it? It's highly processed and refined. It's high in fat and oil. It's high in salt. It's high in sugar. It's high in protein. It's high in calories. It's low in plant, whole plant-based foods. <clears throat> and so what we're finding, and, and Dr. Uh, Professor Barry Popkin also calls these food products, or we can call them processed foods, junk food, uh, 
and these are being exported to the developing countries. The fact is that these countries feel that as they're becoming more economically viable, the population is, has more spending money, they need to become like the West. That's the standard of excellence, the West. And of course the multinational companies are willing to accommodate them with this. And so they're exporting all our processed foods to the developing countries. And they adjust the price to suit the particular locality. If they can't afford as much as we pay in the West, they'll drop the price. And so the food companies have been expanding into these developing countries. Three quarters of their economic growth is now from the developing world, not from the West. The result? Globesity. Let me give you some examples very quickly. First of all, let's have a look at India. Obesity has only been seen in India in the last 15 years. Tens of millions of people have diabetes and they don't even know this because they don't have access to medical facilities because they're too poor. But they can afford to go and buy these processed foods. They're forsaking their traditional foods. Another example, China. In 1990 there was virtually no obesity in China. Now one third are obese and overweight. That is 380 million people. And furthermore, diabetes in young adults is four times that in the United States of America. How wonderful is the move from being underdeveloped to developed, eh? Another example is Brazil. And you know, why not accept it? If you're going to accommodate your taste, perhaps you're going to accommodate your eyesight and make obesity a glamour event. In Brazil, there have been studied 37 cities. And remember the cities there are often around 20 to 22 million people, so we're looking at an awful lot of people. And what have they found? Obesity is increasing at 10% per annum. 50% <clears throat> of Brazilians are now overweight and obese. Another example is Mexico. So we can see some overweight Hispanics here. In 1980 there was no obesity in Mexico, or Mexico if you like. Today in 1999 one third are overweight and obese. In 2006 two thirds were overweight and obese. And notice this and this will surprise you, there is more adult obesity in Mexico than in the United States and that used to be the number one obesity country. So we can see what's happening. We're exporting our lifestyle and our food to the third world countries. And what they used to have, their old traditional foods, which kept them nice and healthy and well, they're now acquiring a taste for Western food and they're paying the consequences. But there is good news. We can do something about this epidemic of obesity. And I just want to tell you very quickly about the CHIP program. Now I know many of you have heard about CHIP. It was founded in 1986 to combat coronary heart disease and it stood for Coronary Health Improvement Program. <clears throat> However, they found after many programs being run that not only were people's coronary health improved but they found that a whole lot of other medical parameters were being improved. And so when Sanitarium saw how effective this program was they decided to fit it in with their new wellness and lifestyle logo and so they purchased from Hansdeal and Hansdeal now works for Sanitarium and they put four million dollars into upgrading the program making it more up to date with modern statistics changing the, uh, the units to units and uh, adapting it to America as well as to Australia 
And they decided, in view of how good this program is in improving overall health, they now call it the Complete Health Improvement Program. <clears throat> and the good news is that this program works. It can combat these modern lifestyle diseases. There have been many papers written about how uh, CHIP is successful. We won't have time this morning, but I'd just like to refer to one. This was a study done on Australasia, New Zealand and Australia, and looking at people, what happened to them on an, over a 30-day period of the CHIP program. BMI, and remember these are average figures. Some individuals got greatly larger results. This is an average. And remember, some of those will not have been complying to the program very well, others will be complying to it very well. So it's an average result. So that's very important to remember. BMI, body mass index, there was an overall re average reduction of 3.8%. Systolic blood pressure, 5.6. Diastolic, 4.6. Total cholesterol, 14.7. LDL, 17.9%. Triglycerides, 12.5%. And fasting glucose, 5.6%. And you can go and look this up on the New Zealand Medical Journal. It was published last year. <clears throat> so, but what's it look like in the long term? Do people adhere to it? Can they adhere to it? Do they continue to get results? And just this year, there was published um, the results of a study over three... Uh, th from people who did the CHIP program three years ago to see how they were going. And the important thing with this is that they found that people who had persisted with the CHIP program continued to enjoy benefits, but not only enjoy those benefits, but even better benefits. And this tells me something very clearly which relates back to our original story. We can educate our palate. And these people on the CHIP program have been able to educate their palate. And you know what? They have come to find out the things they chose to do became the things they love to eat. So that's why CHIP is successful. Because as people change their lifestyle and come to enjoy that, come to change their diet and enjoy that, they come to love what they're doing. Not only because they appreciate the benefits of a clearer mind and better physical health. There was one lady in New Zealand who um, couldn't even walk to the phone. She was out of breath and couldn't talk on the phone. And after the CHIP program, she's now able to talk on the phone and walk. And she's continuing to get uh, improvement. <clears throat> A lot of people say to me, well, that's all very nice, but, you know, I've got coronary heart disease and uh, I've got this and I've got that. It's too late for me. And the rule of dogma has been, in fact, that coronary heart disease was not reversible. But some work done by Dr. Esseltine, and I haven't got time to go into his program, showed that this is not the case. Here's an angiogram. A is before this person started this lifestyle program. Look at the occluded coronary artery here. And this is after being on the lifestyle program. That occluded artery has now opened up again. So we can get improvement by educating our palate. By choosing these things, we can come to love them. Now, the CHIP program has been a wonderful blessing to many people. Thousands have done it. Not only has it been a blessing to church members, that they're able to help them be better stewards of the body and the health that they have, but it has been a great blessing to the community. It is following the gospel example of Jesus, who most of his ministry was done in healing, wasn't it? Just at the beginning of this, uh, this morning, someone told me about a program that they're going to close down because it hadn't brought any baptisms, not bring anyone to Christ. Did Christ do things only with one view in mind, a baptism or winning a person to Christ? Did he? 
Very few are recorded being followers. The ten lepers. Only one came back to even thank him. We're not even told whether he became a disciple. Because Christ came to relieve suffering, which is the result of sin. And don't you think as Christ follows, we should be doing the same thing with the knowledge that we have to be able to relieve suffering. But if you want to have uh, a reason for doing it, other than for compassion and helping people, if you want to put your church on the map, do the CHIP program. There's a little town. My um, Maori is pretty bad. I think it's Hawira is how they pronounce it. It's in the southern part of North New, uh, New Zealand. It uh, has only a population of about 25,000 people. It has a tiny little Adventist church. If that church had burnt down, not one person would have noticed or even cared. They decided they'd run the CHIP program. And they've been running it now for quite some time. And 10% of the population there have now done the CHIP program. The local residents are so enthusiastic that they are helping run the program. They're going to their neighbours and telling them, come down to the Adventist church and do the CHIP program. If the Adventist church burnt down tomorrow, there'd be great sorrow in that community because they realise what a benefit that community has been to that, uh, that church has been to that community. So we can educate our palate. And so there's, CHIP has now helped thousands of people. I don't recall the actual figure they gave us over there at the meetings. So what is CHIP telling us? It's telling us very important things. First of all, we can educate our palate. Secondly, the things we choose to eat become the things we love to eat. Thirdly, the things we choose to do become the things we love to do. Because remember, CHIP is a lifestyle thing. It's not just diet. The sobering fact, however, is to a large extent we can also control our physical but also our mental health. And the CHIP program, many people have reported a reduction in their dementia, not dementia, I'm sorry, their depression while doing the, the, the CHIP program. But well, I jumped ahead of myself. But there's one very important thing that we've learned from CHIP. You can't help anyone who doesn't want to be helped. Now that doesn't apply to the CHIP program. It also applies to Christianity. You can't bring a person to Christ who doesn't want to change their way of life. True? And so that's the limitation of any program that we, we run. Now, remember, all these things apply not only to health, but to the Christian life. This is what the Christian life is about. As Christians, the more we do things, we choose to do things that Christ wants us to do, the more we come to love those things. Isn't that what the Christian life is about? So there's a parallel here between Chip and the Christian life. We as Christians are choosing to do the things that we read about in the Bible, that we see illustrated in the life of Christ, and as we do those things, we begin to love doing them because we want to please him. Because we have a vision of what the new earth is going to be like. I wonder what the vision of the new heavens and new earth brings to you. We need to just pause for a moment and contemplate what we think the new Jerusalem, the new earth is going to be like. Let's look at Revelation 21 and I've just tried to summarise a little bit of what it says there. And John says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel. <clears throat> it had a great high wall with 12 gates. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold. And many artists have tried to visualise this. I wonder what your vision of the new earth is going to be like. I think some people's vision of the new Jerusalem is going to be something like this. We're going to enter those pearly gates 
through the golden arches. We're going to walk the celestial streets looking for somewhere to eat. <clears throat> I hope some people won't be disappointed. The simple fact is that what we're doing here is preparing us to be inhabitant of that celestial city. Let's just think for a moment what we're told about what's going to happen in the new earth. They'll neither harm nor destroy in all my holy mountain. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the older order of things has passed away. Isn't that what we're looking for? Can't we all agree and say yes to that? Amen. Amen. But remember, outside the city are those who have strayed away from God and the sorcerers and the immoral and the murderers and the idolaters and all who love to lie and do so. You know what God is going to decree? Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who does right continue to do right. And then he says he will enter in or she will enter in to the new Jerusalem. So what's that telling me? We're not going to be miraculously changed at the second coming, are we? Where taste, our behaviour, our love, our desires aren't going to be miraculously changed from what we're enjoying here to something new and wonderful in the new world, in the new earth. We are training, if you like. We're educating our palate, if you like. We're choosing to do those things which will make us citizens of the celestial city. We'll enjoy that. We'll love to do it. We all, as Christians, need to stop and think what we are doing. If we love what we're doing, does it fit in with what God has described we need to be doing. If it doesn't, I'll tell you one thing, we'll be most unhappy saints. If we get there, that is. And God, of course, forgives all. So we need to think about this and remember that we are in training. We're developing our tastes, what we love and what we like to do. David said, I desire to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. He enjoyed doing that. He didn't mean he didn't, never made mistakes. But we need to enjoy what we're doing. And we need to remember when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10, the immoral, the thieves, the greedy, the drunkards, the slanderers and the swindlers will not inherit the kingdom. We know that. And then he reminds the Corinthians, that's what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. And that is the process that should be working daily on each one of us. It's a continuing process. So we who are accustomed to doing evil become accustomed but love doing good. So Christianity is about change here and now. It's not about pie in the sky by and by. It's choosing to do those things here that will become the things we will love to do there. Does that register? The things we choose to do here will become the things we love to do there. It has been said that Christianity is not about getting a person to heaven by and by, but getting heaven into a person here and now. Christianity is not about getting a person into heaven by and by, but getting heaven into a person here and now. Impossible? Or 
No things are impossible, God. The power to do this comes from God, not from ourselves. We don't have any righteousness of ourselves, but we can seek his power and his strength to prepare to be citizens of this new order that he's going to set up. Let's just bow our heads. <coughs> Father in heaven, we thank you today for the hope that we have in Jesus. We thank you that we can look forward to a new heaven and a new earth. And Father, we do want to be citizens of that new heaven and that new earth. And we want to prepare here today on this grubby old world, this filthy old world, this depressing old world. We want to prepare here to be citizens of that kingdom. We can't do this in our own strength, Father, but we can help one another. But above all, we can rely on Jesus and do all things through him which strengthens us. May this be the experience of each person, we pray in Jesus' name.